It's a double headliner Fear at the Top episode today with Frontier Touring COO Susan Heyman and Michael Chugg, Executive Chairman, Chugg Entertainment. Susan started her career in Australia's music industry, like many of us, doing work experience and taking on part-time jobs at places like Michael Chugg Entertainment, EMI Music Australia, and our very own brag media title, The Music Network. At Chug Entertainment, she worked her way up from assistant to the general manager to managing director in 2016, overseeing a team of 20 staff, managing partnerships and promoting some of the biggest tours in the world like Sia, Radiohead, Coldplay, Robbie Williams, Dolly Parton, Pearl Jam, Florence and the Machine, Tame Impala, the list goes on. Then in April 2019, Chug Entertainment entered into an exclusive joint venture arrangement with Mushroom Group and Mushroom's promoter arm, Frontier, simultaneously announced a partnership with global giant AEG Presents. These new strategic partnerships saw Susan working closely with late icon Michael Gadinsky on televised concert and record release music from the home front for COVID-19 frontline workers, plus the weekly live stream series The State of Music and the Sound, the hour-long live performance show on primetime TV. And in March this year, Susan moved into an even bigger role... She became COO of Frontier, overseeing artist relations, creative and content development for the business, as well as overseeing Chug Entertainment tours. And Michael Chug is known as a pioneer of the Australian music industry. His name is synonymous with some of the biggest music moments from the past 57 years. After co-founding Frontier Touring Company with Gidinski in 1979, he went on to launch Chug Entertainment in 2000 and has picked up numerous industry accolades across his career, including the prestigious ARIA Icon Award in 2019, a member of the Order of Australia, and Polestar's International Promoter of the Year, which he's won four times. Uh, His philanthropic undertakings are also very substantial. He's raised millions of dollars for charities through initiatives such as Wave Aid, Live Earth and Sound Relief. And his record label and management company, Chug Music, which launched in 2012, has consistently seen huge success. Multi-platinum, Brisbane band Shepherd have charted in 15 countries. Lime Cordial were the most nominated act at the 2020 ARIA Awards. Casey Barnes seems to be a mainstay on the Australian country charts and the Shazam chart too. There's too many wins to talk about, but I'm sure we'll cover a few more as we get into it. Susan and Chuggy, thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having us. Okay, Susan, you are one of the most respected executives in the industry. You have 20 years experience in the touring biz. Can you tell me about, I guess, the top three moments in your career that you think got you to where you are today? He's going to enjoy this, me in the spotlight. (laughs) She hates it. (laughs) Finally. How long have I been trying to get you on Fear at the Top, Susan? It's been a while and I finally conceded when, uh, when I agreed that I would do it with Michael together. So he's, he's always tried to encourage me to do more of this stuff, but it's, it's never where I prefer to be. But that's okay. This could be the first of many. We're never. very lucky Oh, I like you. that. Um, probably, I mean, in the context of that, one of the major moments that got me where I am was meeting Michael. And I think, um, I'm not sure if he even actually remembers this, but I was at university in 1999, might have been, 2001, Um, and I won tickets through the newspaper to the Pacific Circle Music Expo, which Michael was putting on at Fox Studios. And uh, I got off my part-time job early one Sunday afternoon and went down to the expo to uh, see the Whitlam's play in the uh, exhibition hall. And uh, Michael Chug walked up on stage and he drew the winners out of a ballot for a competition to win tickets to the ARIA Awards. And I was standing there just waiting to see a band play and he drew my name out of the barrel. Uh, We hadn't met at that point, but I walked up on stage and won my four tickets and took a couple of friends and my brother along to the ARIA Awards. And that was probably the first of several moments that... Started negotiating your COO salary from there, I reckon. <laughs> yeah, uh, a very strong negotiator at the early days. I, I think I was zero dollars and, and many hours and I was happy to take it. So um, so I did that and then just sort of... That, I think that piqued my interest in, in doing this as a job. I studied a sports science degree. I never really thought that putting on concerts was something you could get paid for, but uh, that was a very big moment. So what was that first day like going in the office? Well, I think I walked in on my first day and I saw concert posters all over the walls in an office building and I thought, what is this place? People in here working every day, coming in and getting paid to put on concerts. No one told me when I was growing up that that was something you could do as a job. So 
that was very exciting to me and I think from that moment I just decided that I was throwing away my science degree and wanted to commit to doing that and I, and I went in and worked for free maybe one or two days a week for a few months until I went traveling the world. I think the second moment was probably when I was in New York on my travels and uh, I desperately wanted to go and see the Strokes play at Radio City Music Hall. The White Stripes were opening and I just got on a plane. I was with family in Canada and I got on a plane. I'd heard from my interning days at Chug Entertainment the promoters sometime released tickets on the day of the show and I thought I'd try my luck and hovered around at Radio City Music Hall and stumbled across a, across a crazy woman with pink hair and combat boots and piercings all over her face and she told me she had one ticket that she could uh, offer for me to buy for 50 bucks and then she disappeared and when she came back um, I grabbed her and we walked in she said it's not actually a real ticket it's a it's a receipt but I <laughs> but, it, but it's legitimate and we'll get in and as we walked past every checkpoint that ticket took us to the front row and I, I sat down at the front row of Radio City Music Hall for this incredible show that was was about 20 years ago now and moment like that just made me kind of gave me a confirmation that I was on the right path and that's what I needed to do so from the beginning of that trip I was determined that when I got back home I was going to turn this into a career. Do you know what I find interesting you saying you worked for free at the start I know um Poppy you started your career working for free at the start and there's like you know we we interview obviously the people at the top of the game on this podcast the executives c-suite level and everyone seems to have the same story I work for free wherever I started um there seems to be this new moment this is a question to both of you I think there seems to be this new movement at the moment going um, working for free is taking advantage and all this sort of stuff. And people are like really revolting against this whole free idea of free internship. Um, and I just don't know where that's coming from or, or, or maybe times have changed. I don't know, but I, I feel like the most successful people in the world, not even just in the music industry, seem to have put in a lot of yards for free to learn. Um, I remember hearing the story like Warren Buffett trying to get um, – trying to get some work experience when he first started working and um, he wrote a letter to this person he wanted an internship from and he said, I'm happy to do all of this and work for free. And the reply to Warren Buffett was, mate, if you come and work for me at free for free, you're still overvalued because I, I'm going to spend so much time teaching you. You're still too expensive mm. at free. So, well, I mean, what do you guys think about that with the whole unpaid internship model? I think it's very disappointing that it's, pretty much disappeared the internship and a lot of young people are really disappointed that they can't actually come and start off in our business I mean it it, for me giving people a chance is really where it was at and still is so with all these new rules and regulations about having to you know have insurance and workers' compensation and all that stuff, it's making it very difficult. And I think the industry is missing out on a lot of great young people. Well, young people are missing out, I think. Like if, they if are. I mean, all these yeah. kids are going to techs and universities and doing all these courses and they can't get into the industry. And, you know, I'm not a big fan of a lot of these courses, but... A few years ago, there were probably three or four hundred kids that could be qualified sound engineers couldn't get a job. And so I think the internship's really important and I think that it needs to be addressed. Mm. I mean, a lot of our staff, our best staff came through that process. And I think the nature of this industry is it's so hard to study for and to find the right experience that we are always, as when we employ, we're looking for the right person, the right work ethic, the right character, the right... um, personality and the skills can be trained and so that's very hard to do but look the thing that that is part of the conversation which I appreciate is that internships that are unpaid do give opportunity to people who can afford to do an unpaid internship and that Mm. is a smaller segment of the community it's a luxury Um, so there are a lot of talented people who can't afford to stay at home with their parents or do whatever they need to do to make that work so I, I can definitely appreciate that but it's been a, a pathway for a lot of our best people. And if they've got any uh, talent at all, they end up working four nights a week selling tickets at the gigs and making money or they get uh, paid to work backstage at concerts and things. So there's plenty of opportunity there. I think there's a few people that abuse the internship and have no intention of uh, 
the people going any further than working for a few months for nothing, but we've never been like that. And um, some of the best people have come that way. I mean, when I started in the business, and moved from Tasmania to Melbourne, I worked in a blanket warehouse and up the road in an old disco in the little lobby of the disco, which wasn't much bigger than this table, Michael Browning and Michael Gadinsky had started Consolidated Rock. So I used to buy them lunch and go and sit up there for an hour and a half and I learnt what was going on and I learnt, you know, and then eventually I got a job as, for $20 a week as the poster boy in the office, the junior, and uh, just went from there. And, you know, if you love music and you want to be in the music business, you go to any steps to get into it. And I think um, a lot of people are not getting that opportunity. And um, I think we need to address it, to be honest. Yeah, and they need to look at, Susan is a great example of that. You know, look at where you are, look at this promotion that you've got, COO. I wanted to ask you about that promotion, actually. When the announcement happened in March, it said that um, you take on the role with a view of growing the business. So what are some of the changes that you made with that restructural, that change, that joint venture that happened? I mean, I think they're still happening and they will continue to happen uh, over time. We are right now facing coming through what I've been calling chapter two of COVID, which is we're past certainly the crisis that we felt with um, threat of illness and, and threat of constant shutdowns and, and restrictions. We've definitely come through that, but we're now trying to adjust to the impact that it's had on the economy and consumer behaviours and figure out what that means for our business. So I think we're focused on getting through that. And we definitely want to continue to grow and develop the business in the way that we honour how Frontier and Chug works and, and Michael Gadinsky's legacy and all of those values. But um, right now it's about ensuring that we get through the sort of bumpy patch ahead that is a post-COVID reality. So, so post-COVID, have you noticed a drop off in consumer confidence? How? What are these kind of ticketing challenges that are happening at the moment? Well, I don't think it's just consumer confidence. I think it's uh, people's confidence in themselves. I think a lot of people have come out of COVID and uh, all of a sudden they're, it's a different world. They're, they're in debt. Uh, they're worried about their children being able to attend school and get on with their lives. They've got credit card debt. They've got you know, there's not a lot of money around. The economy's going through the through the floor um, or the roof, whatever you... Well, the inflation is through the roof. It's fucked. And, uh, <laughs> excuse me, there's the first you one. You can swear. Are we allowed to swear? So <laughs> it's, it's a big worry and a lot of people are suddenly realising, whoa, what have, what's just happened to us? And, you know, uh, somebody... I saw somebody say a couple of nights ago that business is going to go on as usual, but it's never going to be the same again, I don't believe. And we've got a lot of, you know, there's a lot of lack of confidence out there. And you've only got to see that, uh, you know, up to 25% of ticket holders aren't turning up at the gigs. No. The average is about 12 to 12 and a half, 15%. But at some shows, 25% of the punters who paid for tickets are not coming. Do you think that's because they bought the ticket for the show a few like a years ago and it's been rescheduled and rescheduled well, or forgotten? A lot of factors. <laughs> Two or three percent, yeah, I'd okay. say. But that's that's extraordinary that that's happening. And it's not just happening here, it's happening all over the world. And we're probably the lowest average of the tickets. And, um, you know, most of the shows we've got on sale are selling OK, but they're not doing what they would have done pre-COVID. Um, there's well, a lot of last-minute ticket selling and um, it's going to be interesting we haven't gone up with any legacy acts yet any old farts as we used to call them <laughs> before it was cool um, and it'll be interesting to see how that demographic deals with what's going on yeah I'm speaking to a lot of promoters and they're all saying that when you, the, the it's, it's just really hard to get the same traction on an announce that they used to have pre-COVID uh, and people are just waiting a lot longer to buy tickets. Like, if you think about 
you know, Splendors in July, what, that's only a few weeks away, but it feels in a COVID world, consumers are starting to feel like that's a long way away. Like, I don't know what the world's going to be like then. I don't know what I'm going to be doing then. So everyone's just waiting to last minute to buy tickets. So you've got, and, and you're nodding, so you seem to agree. So you've got that, that kind of experience. And then parallel to that, you know, with these inflation issues, you've got production costs going up. Um, I'm sure that there's a lot of uh, sort of HR shortages on the road, production, uh, so that would be it, like your costs are going up. It's harder to forecast revenue because it's coming in a lot later. I guess, Susan, how are you navigating all of that? I think we're figuring it out as we go. Um, you know, it's double, triple whammies. We've got costs are going up for us. Costs are going up for the artists. International flights and freight for them to come out here are, are going up. Um, the response to that is to find ways to give them more income out of their touring, which is putting the ticket prices up, but the consumers can't necessarily afford it. Um, the market is saturated, for sure. We had two years of business that is flooding the market at once. I mean, we were looking at a tour for November this year and we can't get venue availability, which means the market's going to be flooded with content. Is that because there's less venues or no just it's more just too much on it everyone's on. trying to make up for two years of lost touring wow. um and, you know you've got venues that can't get enough security they can't get food and beverage sellers the line ups at food and beverage at some of the shows is outrageous uh, you can't get enough crew to load in and out uh early next year there's a few big tours coming in some haven't been announced yet but we are looking at having to fly and bring a stage from Atlanta to Australia wow. to have enough stages. It's a nightmare. And I think people are, are certainly their behaviours have changed for whatever reason, whether it's financial pressures or fear of getting sick or just simply they got into the habit of enjoying being at home and maybe they're happy to have a dinner party instead of go out to a show, like our behaviours have changed. So we're seeing this saturated market, two or three times as much content, half the number of people wanting to go out, and it's gonna take some time to recalibrate. And I think a lot of the industry has lost a lot of its good people, as you say. We're very fortunate, you know, when we were going through the pandemic, a lot of our staff scratched their heads and kept saying how, you know, we didn't let go of anyone. We had people on reduced hours and, and had to take those measures, but we kept everyone on. And a lot of them were like, how is this, How surely at some point we're gonna lose our jobs, how is this happening? And we just said to them, we know what's at the end of the pipeline Michael, and we know what's Michael coming Gidinsky through. Michael Gidinski was magnificent. He really was and he, he, he was everybody, determined. He, everybody survived because of Michael. Yeah. He kept paying everybody. And I mean, incredible. So, so I heard um, when he passed away, there was just such, um, everyone in the mushroom group was so nervous about their future. Um, and Chuggy, you were actually the one that got in front of the whole company and gave everyone that confidence and that at security. At Michael's funeral at Ormond Hall, I got up and told them they had nothing to worry about. Yeah. And, um, you know, that was, that was the truth of it all. And I know that he would have agreed 100% with what I did. I was, um, quite shocked about, you know, everybody was so freaked out that they were, it was all over and it was never going to be all over. I mean, the reason we did the JV, forget the fact he, he really only did it to get Susan. <laughs> but, uh, the, the truth comes did, out. Yeah. The reason we did great it Great move was, on his part. Uh, <laughs> I said great move on his part. Oh, I could, I could tell him I'm not going to go into it. But I want to go it was, into no, it. No, we're not going to. It's all about the legacy and it always was. And uh, I just felt it had to be said. And, you know, I got into trouble for speaking three minutes longer than all the other people. <laughs> but that had to be done. Can we talk about the deal for a second? Can we talk about whether you shopped it around first? Did you chat to TEG? No, why would I go with those assholes? <laughs> They're destroying our business, those people. No. It was never shopped it around. It was never shopped yeah, around. No. It was something Michael and I had been talking about. You know, when I left, I left because he didn't want to know about the internet. He wasn't interested in going overseas anymore. I was doing it all. Our financial director was giving me a hard time because we were bringing unknown bands like Radiohead in and losing 40 grand. So I left to start my own trip. But Michael and I were always friends. And uh, we always talked. We never went out. 
you know, we never went after each other's acts like other people do. But And we'd been talking for a few years about this. So it finally happened. And when we were talking about moments in my career that brought us where we are, I still remember the day that we had an offering on a major arena tour that really should have been ours. It was an act that was in our wheelhouse and we had a very close relationship with their team. And uh, at the 11th hour, we got outbid by millions of dollars by one of our competitors. And um, I remember walking into Michael's office. I'm a bit more diplomatic than him. Can you tell? I don't, <laughs> don't I can't tell. name yep. names. Yep. Um, <laughs> I walked into You don't want to call them fucking assholes right now? No, we don't need to name names. But I remember the day and I remember thinking, we can't trade as an independent on club tours. We need arena tours to be in business. And if we can't secure arena tours, we're on borrowed time. And this was a tour that for all matter of reasons should have been ours. And I walked into his office and I said, it's time, you need to call Michael. And he called him that day. And I think we had a, our first meeting at 1 a.m. at the Olsen penthouse after the Sia show at Amy Park. And he brought the Melbourne Cup with him. He brought the Melbourne Cup with him. <laughs> that was the first meeting, I think 1 a.m. He, uh, he was disappointed that I wasn't as excited about the Melbourne Cup, but he still brought it in for show and tell. And was it a productive meeting at 1 a.m.? It was. We went through till about 4 a.m. and had a lot of mm. conversations about whether we were on the same page. And I think at the core of it, our values were the same and our ways of working and you know we always like to say that we both chug and frontier have always wanted to put an artist with an audience not a product with a buyer and that's really the philosophy that brought us back together brought them back together i shouldn't assume my no, name it's into us. That. You were a so, big so how do you how I do you said. negotiate a deal like that with gidinski at 1am and you're you know, I, I imagine I mean, the you deal would have... didn't get done for another eighteen months or two years, but that was the first conversation. Yes, about, okay. Are we going to do it? And so, how is it structured now? Are you are you guys equity holders in Frontier, or was did they did Frontier completely buy all the equity in, in Chug Entertainment, or how how is that deal? How no, does that deal work? There was no sale or anything. We're doing a JV. I get a piece of uh, all the acts that we've toured or were we're looking to tour um, all my staff are now employed by frontier full-time and were right through COVID. Uh, basically i have no risk and i get to tell everybody what i think <laughs> <laughs> all the upside and no downside it sounds like yeah. pretty much that's great but and, speaking you know go sorry you go. i was just going to say what michael was referring to at, at the funeral and you know, Gadinsky had really shaped a team of people in a similar way that Michael had with our team who shared the same values and the same passions. And while he was very much the big personality and on the front of all of that, there was an amazing team of people under him who were delivering his vision. And so when he passed away, everyone was just more motivated than ever to continue in that legacy. And there was no uncertainty on what those values were or how to operate, even without him there steering the ship. And in this new chapter, that's very much the focus. And so, wait, did City Pop Records didn't come with that deal, did it? That's no, Chug Music got nothing not? to do with it because that Chug Music's a whole different thing. Okay. If they want to be involved in Chug Music, it's going to cost them millions. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> it's worth well, they a know lot. That. They know that. <laughs> How many millions would it cost? Quite a few. Many. <laughs> okay. Many millions. No, uh, Chug Music was always separate. I mean, for many years, uh, a lot of people um, felt that Chug Music was just a bottomless pit and was never going to work, and I always had faith in that, even when my biggest fans and allies were telling me it was fucked. Um, and it's become a very, very big operation, but it's totally separate. Uh, Mushroom Publishing have probably three of the acts on their per on the publishing side which I don't have a problem with because Mushroom Publishing are probably one of the best publishers in the country, in the world. And that's kept you busy during COVID. Yeah, and, and I had a great time stream. during COVID. We increased our streams from about 100 million a year to 350 million a year. Wow. wow. Last year, all the artists on 
about 320 million last year streams and people say oh, there's no money in it yeah well i got news for you david <laughs> that's how luke so, feels too so it's always been separate um and you know there's a whole separate team different offices everything like that so do you have an exit strategy for the record business in the same way that you kind of exited and jv'd the the promoting side of the business well, I haven't really... Mushroom millions of dollars, wasn't it? We've well, no, there's a few people <laughs> interested. I've just been overseas. A lot of people are very interested. I mean, the young artist, Mia Rodriguez, we did a JV with Atlantic where we actually are part of the world releases. Um, I've always tried to maintain control of... Um, all my artists worldwide because I've seen too many acts sign international deals with major labels in this country and never been heard of again. Mm -hmm. And that was why I started Chug Music in the first place. And uh, I mean, I signed the first act because Shepherd flew down from Brisbane, very nervous kids played in the back office and I knew with the ears of my team and the talent of my team, if Shepherd were any good, they were gonna get they were either, I was going to be told they were shit or they were good. And I was told the songs were great and the harmonies were great. And that's when I started Chug Music. And I had Brian Brown driving me crazy about these two young kids from the Northern Beaches. Mm -hmm. And I went to the Bears Den at the Metro one rainy, freezing night. And <laughs> you talk about Lime? Yeah, and then yeah, Ian, ja out. Ian James, who worked for Michael, uh, told me about this young kid in Brisbane called Andrew Stone. And... Uh, how brilliant he was and he came down, we met and that was that. And I said to Ian James, and I probably shouldn't say this either, why haven't you told Gadinsky? He said, I wouldn't do it to Andrew. <laughs> so Andrew Stone uh, has an episode of Fear at the Top. I encourage everyone to go listen to it. Co-owner of City Pop Records with Michael. It's a great episode. So I, I want to ask about the touring. So you've got, um, I want to ask about the margins on touring specifically. So just before I lead into my next question, the average margin on a tour of an arena tour is what? Profit margin? 15, five to 15%. Okay, great. So you of, the, of the net, not the gross. Mm. Yep, so you're making five to 15%. Of the net. Inflation going up like crazy, ticket softening. I'd imagine now we're treading water at break even hopefully for a bit or, or or what that is well it's it's percentage of the net so it just depends on what deal we've done it just might change what that number is but the the margin will be the same got it, it. Got it's it. um yeah the margin's the same it might change the dollar value i mean the thing is that we and michael was the same we're not going to put up ticket prices to absorb the inflation and everything because it's not fair to the punters. So whenever we're putting a tour together or making an offer, we spend a lot of time looking at ticket prices and all that sort of stuff. Because um, as Susan said earlier, it's about the punter and the, the music, not about the product and the brand and all that. So if I think about your competitors then and you've got these operators that own so much of the value chain from the parking to the ticketing to the venues to the, you know, I feel like as inflation and um, ticket prices can't be moved and all of that, I feel like they're much better set up to absorb um, all those extra costs because they're, and you know, they're coming in millions of dollars overbidding and stuff because they're making so much money from all these other things that aren't just the tour. Um I think that the, yeah. the big point of difference for us, which is exactly that, and it comes from when we were um, independent at Chug Entertainment, we didn't have, you know, Gadinsky's power hold of a 360 company. We didn't have the checkbook of some of our competitors. So we started trading on being the best people to work with, trying to yeah. be collaborative and cooperative and care about the artist's career and uh, be real promoters and marketers and thoughtful and give deliver an incredible experience. I mean, Gadinsky's legacy and Frontier's legacy of hospitality is second to none. I mean, these artists come in and are so well taken care of. Um, you know, they would stay at his house in Mount Macedon. They would uh, be taken so well care of and be on the other side of the world as if they were at home. And that's, I think that's, that's that what we need as our... That was always there from the moment we started Frontier in 1979. I mean, I was... 
Paul Davies, tour director through the 70s, and I learned off him that you really look after the artists. And, I mean, there was a motive for him doing that because back in then there were no such thing as percentages. The acts would get paid and the promoter would make millions of dollars. Well, that all changed. But uh, we never, Michael and I never, ever compromise. And even when you're losing on a tour, we never compromise. We never short change the artist. And, you know, you get artist managers and even the artists themselves will come up and say to you, we know you must be losing half a million dollars and you're treating us like you're making half a million dollars. Well, that's the way we do it and that's why we very rarely lose acts. And when we do lose an act, it's not because we're no good, it's because they've been offered ridiculous ridiculous money but it's rare isn't it because you've noticed it over the years there's so many return tours so many they're, they're chug entertainment acts you know that yeah. when they announce a tour you know that they're going to tour with you and there's certainly look there's no question that there's tours that we would lose when uh, one of our competitors can throw in other revenue streams um but what we work on and what we're really conscious of is providing something that is about more than money Susan, can you tell me a bit about the Frontier Org chart? Like, who's reporting into you at the moment? Who are you reporting to? How does the team sort of work work for for the current setup? Well, we're still the the structure that was announced a few months ago was a new executive team after Michael passed away, which is uh, Dion Brandt as our CEO, and then myself, Andrew Spencer, and Regan Stark on that executive team. There is a board which includes some members of AG and Matt Gadinsky and uh, then we have a, a layer of senior management and I guess the pillars of the tour delivery mechanism are within departments in the company, ticketing and venue operations, marketing, communications, legal, uh, finance and we have a number of promoters and joint venture partners. So I report into Dion at the moment and I my remit is tour operations and content delivery so I work with the promoters and the JV partners and the staff responsible for tour operations. And so do you have any um, input into the budgets that the promoters have to offer out on certain deals and things or um, do, the, do the deals come to you and then you execute? Uh, well, I work on deals of, that I'm responsible for, so I'll work on those myself and the tours that I do with Michael and then the other promoters within the business. I'll work with them, but ultimately all of our promoters have their own relationships and their own way of doing things and that is the secret to their success. So I'm just there to support and help um, as we work through the negotiations and, and what we're presenting to the artists with them, but they're very much uh, empowered to do their own jobs. How, how big is the team at Frontier now? I think we're about 40 people. Probably, probably 50. Yeah. And so what would the mix of that 50 be? Marketing, ops, like what, what's the breakdown-ish? God, you're testing me. Probably, <laughs> there's probably about, I think there's about 12 in marketing communications. Frontier has always had an incredible marketing team, big part of their, their success. We um, at Chugs, when we came over, we had a very small but very punchy marketing team who carried, I think we had three people deliver the Elton John farewell to a campaign, wow. which is pretty amazing. Um, I remember being on the phone with Elton's PR team and they said, which, which uh, publicist or publicity company do you use? I said, oh, her name's Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> she's doing the whole tour. I was like, yeah, she's, she's very good. Kills it. <laughs> Um, but yeah, we, we still, we placed the same value on that function of, of touring, but didn't have the same resource. But, you know, Frontier has developed that team with an incredible database and an incredible promo team. Um, tour operations is about seven or eight, a couple of people in legal, four or five in finance. Two and in ticketing. Yeah. We've one got, or two in production. We have a lot of freelance people we bring in as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, so of those 50 people, how many directly report into you? First? Most of them. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'd <Yeah>. hope not. <laughs> uh, probably 10 to 12. Okay, that's, 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 that's a substantial. lot. Substantial. Yeah. Um, and, and how do you work with them? Are you on, are you just 
day to day as needed or do you have a structured weekly catch up with each of them or how are you kind of making sure they're supported like what's your structure with those direct reports uh we're we're actually still developing it as we go as we work through you know with our business we we brought chug and frontier together a few months before a global pandemic hit and then we lost our, the founder of Frontier. So there's been a lot of change in the two or three years that we've been together. So now that we've established this structure, the, the leadership team was the first part of that. And we're working collaboratively to restructure the team and restructure some of our process and systems in a way that is as with as little disruption as possible because ultimately we're still navigating a tricky landscape and a really busy couple of years ahead. So we're trying to evolve our processes rather than throw down big shocking changes and, and have people have to juggle those in amongst a pretty tough time anyway. We have a couple of regular calls every week on Zoom and uh, there are, then you, you'll have a mushroom call with 150, 200 people as well. I mean, uh, behind the whole Frontier Chug thing is this incredible situation that they build up where they have an events department that supply talent for the AFL and the Victorian Racing Club and the Australian Open and quite a lot of other events. They also have a, uh, a company that works with some of the biggest corporate identities in Australia, providing talent, tours, whatever. And so there's a great, what's the word, uh, there's a great uh, ground level situation behind the touring companies. And I think that also helps us make the difference that we can't give an act 20% of the food and beverage at Kudos Arena or 25% of the ticketing income or anything like that. So, you know, we, Michael built a, was building a great organisation and, you know, after we did the JV, we went into two and a half years of COVID, so there was no tours. And, um, in a way it was great because it gave Susan and, and Regan in Melbourne and all these other people uh, plenty of opportunity to get to know each other. And I think that shows now how strong the teams are and um, it's very exciting. So I'll ask this question to both of you. Um, Susan, you can go first. What does the next 24 months look like from a general Australian live music point of view to you? Where do you see, do you see any changes in ticket prices, uh, the type of the type of acts that are on, like the amount of investment that go into festival lineups, the amount of side shows that are happening? Like just generally speaking, as broad or as narrow as you want to be, what do you think is going to, the next 24 months going to look like? I think there's going to be a lot of learning and I think the learning is going to change month to month. I mean, we're all seeing behaviours and, and um, anecdotal evidence of how the industry is shaping up and it could change in three months again. I think the market will be very saturated. It's going to be a ton of content and some tours will do well with that and some won't. Um, I think it's probably going to be, unfortunately, a bit of a tough time for domestic artists touring just because there's been a, an absence of international talent. So that's going to be hard to break through and, and get attention when there's every major international act touring and, and vying for the ticket buyer's dollar. Um, and I think we're going to have to reset some of our supply chain, some of our staff. Um, what does that mean? We just, there's a lot of people have left the industry, so we're going to have to retrain and, um, you know, we're seeing it, what I was talking about earlier when we were talking about Gadinsky keeping everyone on staff. We're seeing now the benefits of that because we have people who, who, you know, might be a bit dusty, all of us, but know how to do their job and know how to work together. But there's a lot of um, different, whether it be venues or ticket companies or suppliers that have lost people and are now retraining. And it's that stuff just takes time. So I think it's going to be a recalibration for a while. Yeah. Michael? Yeah, I agree with that. I Ticket prices aren't going to rise that much. They'll rise because they have to, because of inflation and everything. But, you know, I um, you can easily overprice an act and you've got to be very careful. So I don't think ticket prices will go up. Maybe the airline costs and the hotel costs will stabilise, but it's tough out there. I think uh, 
getting uh, the road crews back together is really hard. Um, you you know you book eighty people to come and load a show in now, and only forty six turn up. You mm. all of a sudden you're paying venues overtime to stay on, so that because the loadout's taking instead of taking two hours, it's taken six hours, and there's a lot of unknowns there. And uh, you know I think uh, also the punters going to an arena and having to line up for a beer for three quarters of an hour they're going to stop going. So there's a lot of problems with staffing and that's probably the biggest thing we're going to face, I'd say. I mean, the other thing, which is probably too big a conversation to open up at this point in the podcast, but weather events are getting more frequent and more problematic. I mean, we got through, I don't know how many, how, first thing I saw was in America with Bonnaroo Festival when they got through one or two cycles of COVID and then there was a tornado that ripped through and the festival nah. couldn't happen and we saw it happen here. Yours and ours festival, there's been a number of those situations where, you know, you make it through the COVID um, gauntlet and then there's a, a storm or floods or... So that's, you know, going to continue to be a problem for... Yeah, yeah for I think a lot of festivals will start and disappear. I think... Um a lot of, well, you know, we just, Mark Pope, we just put together that free concert in Lismore and we basically set up in the mud and played in the mud and the rain for five weeks after the floods. And, uh, you know, if it wasn't for the roadies and companies like Coats Hire and that that gave us everything for nothing, we wouldn't have put it on. And, uh, you know, ten, we gave away 10,000 odd tickets um, they had to apply for the tickets in the postcodes that were most affected. And um, we gave away 10, 11,000 tickets like that. We sold about 1,500 tickets on the day, 7,000 people scanned through the gates. So basically 5,000 people didn't come wow. because of the weather. And it was mudstock. It was people were up to their mudstock. ankles. But all the bands turned up, all played for nothing, and we did it. But... To go and do that and be charging money would be a real problem and will be a real problem because this weather is crazy and it's not going to get any better. And, uh, you know, hopefully we've got rid of the Morrison click and hopefully Alba will put his jeans and his check shirt back on and get back to business. Do you have faith in him? I do have faith in him. He's a music man. Um, always has been. I don't like what the minders did to him with his new glasses and his suits and all that <laughs> stuff, but that's... <laughs> I'm being straight up. Um, if it hadn't have been for him, we would never have toured Dolly Parton way back uh, because each uh, state, as they have different railway lines, they also have different roads. So we couldn't get her buses into the country because they were uh, a couple of hundred pounds too heavy for one state's roads and too wide for another state's roads and and right hand drives and yeah, and right hand drive mm -hmm. so we went to Albo who at that time was minister for transport national and he got he got um, the buses into the country the tour went ahead and when Dolly met him at Kudos she rubbed his head in amongst her beautiful <laughs> boobs and I'm sure he's never forgotten. <laughs> Bless Dolly Parton. He I did. If you, if you Google it, there is a. She thanks him in her press conference. It was a nice little moment. She did. Yeah. Can we can we cut in that in the edit? <laughs> cut in the thank you. I have some people I want to thank. <laughs> you thought these were boobs. This is paper wads. I wanted to also especially thank Anthony Albanese. Is that how you say his name? Yeah. The uh, Minister of Transportation. He was so good to make sure that we got my bus is here. I hear there was quite a bit of press about that. So I don't know if he's here today. If he is, if he'll come up here, I'll smear lip gloss all over him. <laughs> that, that was an unbelievable press conference. I've never laughed so much in all my life. She was unbelievable. Yeah. And somebody asked her a question and she pulled her notes out of the bra. It was sensational. She said, someone said to her, how long does it take to do your hair every morning? And she said, I don't know, I'm not there. <laughs> I love it. She was wonderful. You anyway. know, I, I'm, I'm listening to you both speak 
And it sounds like there's a lot of content coming two years worth in the next 12 months. So it feels like consumers are going to win. It sounds like there's a huge demand on venues. So I feel like venues are going to win because I don't think they're going to be giving discounts anytime soon. It sounds like there's a lot of sh- big shortage on s- supply chain staff. So staff that are there and staying in supply chain can charge their full rate and getting paid more than they've ever been paid. It sounds like everyone seems to be in a much stronger position pre-COVID except for the promoters is what I'm understanding. And you would say that you would say that the Australian artists, I know you mentioned the Australian artists aren't going to, aren't going to, it's going to be a tough go in the next 24 months. But I also think the last 12 months have probably been really good for them anyway. So it's going to balance out. Their profile has been built more than it Mm -hmm. would have. It was a a great silver lining of COVID. It was Mm. a great time. Yeah, I don't necessarily agree with Susan that it's going to be a hard time for the Australian acts. I think that'll go on anyway. Yeah, why do you say that? Because that's how it's been for the uh, 60 years I've been in the business. Yeah. That's a good answer. (laughs) Um, Yeah, and (laughs) like we are about to go overseas for six months. George and Amy Shepard are in LA writing for the fourth album, which they've got to record, so it doesn't really fuss me that much, to be yeah. honest. And Casey's just finished a huge tour and needs to go to Nashville and write more songs, so I'm OK. OK, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I think the Australian X will be fine. Yeah. But, yeah, it is, it's tough for promoters. It it's, feels like it. It's tough. I mean, we're also, with every changing shape of the world promoters seem to take on the liability you know when there's terrorism threats weather events pandemic crowd safety the liability tends to fall to us and it's a high risk um, part of the industry anyway you know we're we're not making money till those back few rows and it's definitely um it's a bit of a mugs game isn't it well, yeah, when you... it's always been a mugs game. You do it because you love the music, not because you want to make millions of dollars. Yeah. If you're good at what you do, you make enough money, but it's all about loving the music. I mean, it was the greatest feel I get, and I know Michael was the same, was standing on the side of the stage watching 10 people, 10,000 people, 50,000 people having the greatest time of their lives for a couple of hours. Mm. And that's still how I see it and, you know, as I said, if you couldn't, what you do, the money comes. I think the venues and I think the staff and I think, well, I don't know about certain ticketing agencies, but in the main, I think everybody's going to be very supportive. If they're not, well, we'll just start doing more greenfield shows and risking ourselves in hurricanes and cyclones. But, I mean, even if they have a good couple of years, it's been a really tough couple of years mm. for all of those people. Yeah, you know, it it's, not be, just it's been yeah. a lot of people are really hurt. A lot of people, uh, businesses didn't survive, didn't make it through. And it's it's kind of wild coming back, even things like one of the first shows we had. Um, I know that the site guys were having trouble finding site sheds because they'd all been repurposed to mining towns and they couldn't find sniffer dogs because the dogs had been repurposed to other roles. and Generators. You know, whether all of those those people and, and um, businesses come back to touring, we'll have to wait and see. Michael, um, it's incredible privilege to have you on the podcast again. Um, it's You're an iconic figure and, and we're really grateful to that you give your time to, you know, the media and, and the music industry as much as you do. But Susan, you know how long I've been trying to get you on Fear at the Top. Um, you are, you know, quite literally one of the most respected executives in the music industry, I think whenever worldwide, let's get it right. Worldwide, the global music I've industry. Just, I've just done three weeks in America. A week we did together in Nashville, but the amount of people that tell me that she's one of the greatest female people in our industry around the world, they're correct. I would even say not even just female, but just executive. Yeah, I hope you jump in and go, actually. I'll fuck it again. I'm showing my eyes. I'm showing my eyes. You were quoting them. It's fun. I just, whenever a senior job comes up in in the music, I mean, the Sony ones come come up now, obviously. Everyone's like, Susan should take it. Susan should have it. And I know that probably gives you a heart attack, Michael. No, not at all. Your name. I was supporting it. Because I knew she wouldn't take it. Who'd want that job? I mean, this is probably a good opportunity also to say, you know, 
there's been a lot of conversations in the last couple of years about um, the the struggle for women in the industry. And I have to say that working, it's been 20 years with Michael and a lot of my success is because I've worked with someone who genuinely wanted me to succeed and wanted to open doors. Um, I always called that the style of management that he had was um, empowerment with a safety net. So he always oh, let like me that. go. And I always knew if something went wrong, um, I wouldn't be, you know, scold for it I'd be supported and it's really shaped how I manage people I've, I've pushed people into opportunities that they might not think they're ready for the same way he did with me I was thinking about it before we came to this podcast and I remembered um, maybe three years into working for Michael I said to him I want to start a we should do an Irish music festival I think it was a moment when like Snow Patrol and Damien Rice it was just this slew of incredible Irish music and uh, he said well why don't you go over there and meet the managers and go to the festivals and see what's going on. And I, I mean, I must have been 26 or something. Yeah. And he said, he sent me over and credit also to Matthew Lazarus Hall, who was part of the business for 10 years, he was the same. So I, I really do, I've certainly worked hard for my own success, but I do appreciate what uh, a gift it is to have someone who doesn't obstruct and who supports and, and clears the path. And I think that's a really important thing. I've always believed in women in the industry. I was very proud for many, many years that we had the biggest female staff of any company in our industry. Um, and they weren't treated like secretaries or fired when they got pregnant or any of that shit. And I'm very proud of that and, uh, you know. But it's not even that. It's actually just saying, you know, a number of people would call try to go over my head on things and he would always direct them back to me. It's those, it's the little behavioural things that made a big difference of, of genuine. I've always been a big believer that employing women and not empowering them is worse than just not employing them in the first place. That's right. I will say that was one of the very first lessons I learned when Poppy and I started the Bragg Media. So she would get in some punch on with somebody on the phone. Then they You were would, pretty good at they, that in the early days, <laughs> weren't you? Yes. <laughs> then they would call me and then I'd try to resolve it. And then Poppy's like, why did you try to resolve mm. it? Just tell them to call me back. I'm dealing with it. I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And that yeah. was like a big thing for me. So I was like, yeah, now now when everyone calls me, I'm like, this is not my problem. This is a Poppy yeah. problem. Straight back to Poppy. It's but so, it's really it's so nice important. to hear you say those things because that's <laughs> – a lot of what I love about working with Luke and having Luke as a boss too, empowerment with a safety net, that's totally what I have. And it's what's needed for any person to succeed in the industry, I think. Yeah, if you, they've got to feel like they can fail. Mm. But you Then know, you take the risks. We, uh, we had one, I was so stressed when we decided to do SEA in stadiums and it was a crazy idea and I was so worried about it because it was my idea and I thought it was going to fail and he he actually was just like, stop worrying about it. It's my money. I'm fine with it. That's We're huge. Doing it. He has your back. So I really, um, I have to give credit for that. And I think it's so important to allow people to grow and succeed, reach their potential. If you believe in what you're doing, 99% of the time, it'll work. Um, and it's the one thing that I learned with Michael when we started Frontier. We never, ever gave up. If the tour was selling like shit and we were looking like we were going to lose a lot of money, we would work and work and work and work. And nine times out of ten, the tour ended up either breaking even or making money. And that's been how we do it still today. We never give up. We don't ring the agent or the manager and try and get a cheaper deal. We don't cancel shows with false excuses. We get on with it. And that's the difference between us and most of our competitors and it's also one of the reasons that the bands stay loyal michael susan you both are an incredible inspiration i think actually one thing i'm taking away from this if i'm a manager and i'm going to tour australia i'm probably got to give you a call now um it is it seems like an incredibly inspiring company to do business with um you both should be incredibly proud of everything that chug and frontier are doing thank you so much for coming on fear at the top Thank, Thank you. you for having us. Thank you. It's been fun.